All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. We're recording on Martin Luther King Day uh, in the afternoon as I sweat out Pelicans Mavs, uh, which is a low key, high stakes game uh, in the Southwest Division. Very strangely constructed team, the Pelicans, Drew. Uh, I don't know who, I don't think God intended for Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram to be on the same team. Just seems quite redundant. Uh, but here we are. We're going to talk about uh, the aftermath of Lions Rams and the NFC title market, uh, though we don't know the result of Bucks Eagles as we record. Then we'll tackle the NFL awards markets and how they close and what we expect will happen there. Uh, and then we'll talk a little Australian Open to close. But let's start off with Lions-Rams. What were your takeaways out of that game? And do you see the Lions as any threat to win the NFC relative to price? Sure. <laughs> if Goff's going to play that well, why not? Um the uh the yeah the major t- i mean you know as uh, as a uh, bent uh futures holder for the rams member of the ram card carrying member of the ramley um i was doing a lot of lions and zebras colluding to get you know knock the rams out of the playoffs uh because i felt like it was a pretty uh favorable whistle for the lions in that game but you know i'm looking I'm, i was watching it through uh rams blue colored glasses so uh, maybe it was it was two way street, but um, <clears throat> ultimately, uh, Goff and the offense for the Lions was unstoppable last night uh, for huge stretches of that game. Um, I thought, uh, kind of, if there was a villain to to really kind of pick on, it was McVeigh and some of his in game decision making. Um, you know, he sort of took his foot off the pedal right at the wrong time, which has been a thing he's done a lot in his coaching career to this point, particularly in these high leverage games. Um, you know, it was, it, consider, I know it was it was going to be a tough conversion for them. Uh, there's still a lot of time left. Uh, you, the wasting timeouts early in the uh, second half was pretty inexcusable, and you kind of look at the way the end of the game played out. Um, and uh, you know, giving the ball back to the Lions was was a rough call there. Uh, I thought uh, that said, um, you know, the Lions are good. They're flat out good. Their offense is good. Their defense created some uh, advantages in the pass rush. That's uh, you know, the, I, I think um, um, you know the fact that the under got home was insane. Um, but the Lions' defenses, they're fine. You know, they have they have an ability to generate uh, mismatches and, and win 1v1, particularly in the D-line, uh, now that Alan McNeil is back. And uh, Hutchinson, you know, he's playing a lot better than we saw through the middle of the season. Maybe he was dealing with an injury at that point in time. Who knows? But um, he's a certified star, and he's playing like it right now. So uh, do the Lions have scope to win again? Absolutely. As we sit here today, it is going to be the winner of Eagles Tampa, who heads to Detroit and plays in the early slot on Sunday. And uh, Lions are going to be touchdown favorites if it's Tampa, probably, and maybe six, four, five, four and a half, six if it's uh, Philly. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely uh, likely that the Lions will be in the NFC Championship game. And uh, considering how well the Packers played, I don't think uh, it's outrageous that the you know, NFC Championship game is in, is in Detroit again. And at that point, uh, you know, you need chaos to really help get any kind of a future price home here with the um the lines in the kind of four to one range but um you know i i I think the best outcome possible for us as players is that the lions deliver an absolute haymaker next week like just drop the app you know drop the hammer on whoever kind of stumbles into that game uh, really impressed people. Meanwhile, you know, the the Niners get through by the skin of their teeth against a, an informed Packers offense. Um, and then maybe we get a deflated price to bet the uh, Niners in the NFC Championship game. Because I got to tell you what, man, <clears throat> as good as you can say positive things about this Lions defense and their performance yesterday, um, Shannon had. Shanahan's going to absolutely shred that unit. So um, I'm pretty excited to kind of single. Uh, you know, Niners in that spot. Hopefully we get, uh, you know, some sort of price under a touchdown. And I think that's a, that's a walk-in. Right. You really don't like the Eagles, do you? I don't think they're going to be that <laughs> big of a dog against the Lions. I think the look ahead is Detroit minus two and a half, um, okay. which I think is, I mean, A.J. Brown is likely back for that game. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
We'll see. I mean, this Eagles team, I know they're fraudulent relative to their 10 and 1 start, but they still did start 10 and 1 and they beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead. They beat the Bills. There is still that team is still lingering somewhere, though. Maybe they're just so injured at this point. Uh, and the defense is so broken that it doesn't matter. Certainly, I think the Lions are the better team, uh, but we will see. I think it's very encouraging that Goff was able to have that type of game in that situation. Sneaky thing about Jared Goff, for all of his sins and as maligned as he is, I will never forget someone who wagered on him in this game. NFC title game in New Orleans. He showed up for that game and he played, I thought, really well after a tough start where you know they were struggling to get the plays in with the crowd noise and everything. And yes, uh, Tommy Lee Lewis was... Uh, murdered on the field by Nikel Roby Coleman, uh, and that's what everyone remembers with the DPI that wasn't called. But Goff did play really well in that game against the really good New Orleans team. Didn't play so well two weeks later in the Super Bowl, but alas, uh, I think it's a red flag that Matthew Stafford, with Cooper Cup doing absolutely nothing, was still able to put up uh, 0.45 EPA per play against yeah. the Lions. Defense, I don't think they're going to have any answer whatsoever uh, for the Niners should that ultimately be the matchup. And then you touched on the other thing. Like, you can make the case that the three best coaches in the NFL are Shanahan, Reed, and McVay. Like, you can make that case. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think those are also the three guys who might be the worst at fourth down decision making. Clearly, being a genius at scheming offenses uh, has no correlation whatsoever to. Uh, uh, probability being dictated by going for it or not in fourth down. And what I don't, what seems to just not register in the moment is that with McVay not going for it on fourth and 14, first of all, I don't know why you're not playing in the third and four, just trying to treat that as, you know, four down territory and get the third down play to get you closer. But on the fourth and 14, like, it's not about the Lions scoring again because the Lions have no interest in scoring. The, all that matters is the Lions getting two first downs. Right. If you give up the first first down, if you don't convert from the Detroit 44, well, they're still not in field goal range. So like, what does it what does it matter? And if they do score quickly, then it's fine. Then you get the ball back. So it just didn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. Uh, Brett Maher, uh, probably good for him that the Rams didn't get the ball back, frankly, because he was making a meal of those 29 yarders. Yeah, he really was. felt like he was not going to make a 47 yarder for the win uh, at the Horn if it came down to that. But ultimately, I think the better team, uh, prob probably the better team, uh, advanced uh, and they will be favoured to make the NFC title game. Uh, and we'll talk about their matchup uh, once we know what it is following Eagles Bucks. All right, before we get to NFL awards, another chapter in one of the most storied rivalries in college basketball. Drew will be written Tuesday night. Number one, Purdue takes mm. on Indiana in a Hoosier territory, and you can only see it on Peacock. Catch the game live at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. All right. NFL awards markets. I think we are going to be doing uh, a live stream uh, from Las Vegas uh, the night of the awards, which I don't really know how to feel about. I'm not sure I want people to see me uh, if Joe Flacco wins the <laughs> player of the year, but uh, I think it's no. no chance. But uh, anyway, don't want to get reported. Uh, but we'll we'll do that. But for now, let's go through these markets and how they close. I think the two that we can. Uh, unequivocally say, uh, totally done. Uh, MVP, Lamar Jackson will win that market. And Offensive Rookie of the Year, CJ Stroud, will win that market. Uh, the others, I think, are in at least some degree of doubt. Might go through them just in order of the, the degree. Uh, offensive Player of the Year, I was expecting that by this time I would be putting Christian McCaffrey in the 100% bucket. Yeah. Not quite there on 100%. I think more like 95%. I was surprised by how many people have come out and said Tyreek. And I mean, I think the thought process in this market has always been that, oh, McCaffrey's going to win, but like I would vote for Tyreek and it's not particularly close. I feel like he's had the better season. His yards per route run is historic. He's more important to his offense, I think, than McCaffrey is to San Francisco's. And voters are coming out and kind of saying that same thing. Now, I don't think that's going to be the majority. And I think McCaffrey will ultimately win with ease. But do you think there's any chance for Tyreek, who closed? Uh, he closed as a plus 175 dog, but that was before he lost to Buffalo on the Sunday night game. Yeah. 
I think there's a chance. I mean, I agree with you. Most of uh, you know the public stuff that we've got is saying that this is a closer race than I would have uh, kind of anticipated, surely. Um, and I also agree with you. Tyree Kill deserves the consideration fairly uh, and you know, would have been my first place vote if we voted. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's like a, there's a, a kind of a weird fantasy football nature to this one. Like people seem to be super duper high on Christian McCaffrey because of what he produces at a fantasy football level, as opposed to like his actual schematic advantage that he gives you being on the field. Whereas with Hill, it's like, it's not really a contest. Um, and I think the fact that people are kind of going to use this as the opportunity to have tip and acknowledge how great the Niners were this year, how great their offense was. This is kind of feels like that's why he's sort of the, the default choice. But um, yeah, I think uh, uh, I have some Hill in pocket from preseason prices. It's not a very big bet, but it was, uh, um, you know, it's, it's not nothing. And uh, I don't think I'm going to, uh, I don't think I'm going to tear up that ticket until we get this result. Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah. When, for Hill backers, including myself, I'd much rather Tyreek win this award uh from a betting perspective anyway uh and i i would say it's about a 20 to 1 shot but it's not it's not completely done uh another well i think this market actually might be closer to completely done that's defensive player of the year where miles garrett closed the favorite minus 190 tj watt was plus 200 parsons plus 300 there ends your list of candidates who have any chance whatsoever to win the award now the instructive thing with this is that uh, Miles Garrett got 40 first-team All-Pro votes, TJ Watt got 32, Micah Parsons got 22. That means that Micah Parsons is 0% to win Defensive Player of the Year, and I it means that Miles Garrett is a hefty favorite. I don't... I think there is... Now, I haven't really done the, the math on how the distributions could work out, but I think this makes Miles Garrett like north of 95% to actually win the award and pretty close to 100%. Is that your rate? Okay. If you're going to be sweating out comeback player of the year, I'm going to be sweating out this one <laughs> because I have no what. Uh, I never covered, uh, never played any defense there whatsoever. Um, my biggest awards position was uh, Miles Garrett with the bullet. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, this one's one I, I <clears throat> yeah, the, when I, I, I was ner I was very nervous after the week 18 results came in um, and Garrett didn't play. Um, and, you know, the what, on tv you know he does you know he, he's he's he, he gets his team to the playoffs you know like there's a narrative there i'm like oh he's leading leading the league in sacks it's like oh goodness gracious here we go um and uh but then seeing the all pro votes was like a a, sh a little bit of an exhale um it's not a huge margin uh there's going to be some split votes there's going to be some down down ballot impacts here but i think the fact that there are 22 parsons uh and that this was kind of bantied about as garrett parsons for most of the last half of the season and Watt was kind of a late comer to the discussion um that means there's probably going to be more one garrett two parsons three watts than there are going to be one watt two parsons three garrett's does that check out? I think you might yeah. just like there might be just enough kind of down ballot where where Garrett is one or two, Watt is one or three, and uh, Parsons is two or three. Yeah, I mean it's already come out. Like some people have left TJ Watt off the ballot, and I would be because his underlying stuff isn't amazing relative sure. to Garrett and Parsons in terms of pass rush win rate and pressures, uh, and he was on a worse defense and a worse team than Garrett. Just with everything that was already coming out in terms of voters talking publicly, it always it already seemed that like it was trending towards Garrett's direction. And before the All Pro vote was released, I would have said Garrett was eighty to eighty five percent, and now I think he's like pretty north of ninety five percent. And I wouldn't wouldn't say it's impossible. And I do think that if TJ Watt had not got hurt and had sacked Tyler Huntley one more time to get to twenty, I think he may have won the award. Uh, because that would have been such a kind of powerful round number, such a big statement. But the fact that he got injured and the weirdness and he got 19, not the nice round number of 20, and that Garrett was the guy for the whole year. Uh, but the main thing is really just the all-pro vote uh, and being such an indication. So I suspect Miles Garrett will win that one. Uh, I don't think Miles Garrett's coach is going to win coach of the year. And that market, Ooh. which was in huge flux where... Uh, before the Texans beat the Colts, Stefanski was minus 1,000 in the market. 
uh, D'Amico was plus 800. And then following that result, the next morning, uh, the market closed pick. Following that, D'Amico Ryans wins the AFC South thanks to Derek Henry and Ryan Tannehill and company. <laughs> uh, and everything that voters have said, uh, everything that I've seen and heard, I think D'Amico has a pretty hefty lead. Uh, and even though not all precincts have reported, the 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 vote that we get that is made kind of public, semi-public, people being like, oh, I think I'd probably go with this guy, which means they went with that guy, really. <laughs> uh, that is obviously representative of what is to come. And yes, you can get some weirdness, but stuff like, you know, last year, Laurie Markkinen got like 30 of the first 40 most improved player votes. Like that means that he wins, even though yeah. there's 60 votes left, it has to be somewhat rock representative of what is to come. And from what I've seen, D'Amico has a huge lead. Uh, and I don't think, I don't really see any reason why that isn't representative of what is to come with the remaining votes. So I think this one is close to done. Uh, but what do you think of Coach of the Year? <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, that was a great job by you in a lot of ways. Uh, the uh, the uh, precincts reporting comment, especially, find that funny. Uh, you've got a future in uh, political coverage, which is, uh, you know, so definitely start warming up your engine because that's going to, a lot of 2024 is going to be about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I agree with your take. And, you know, if I, I, um, I will go to my grave that PJ Tucker making three three pointers in the final <laughs> game for the Sixers won Joel and beat MVP. And that was absurd. This is even more absurd, which is Trevor Lawrence overthrew Calvin Ridley and like, what would have been the game winning touchdown. And uh, so, you know, so Demeco Ryan's beats Kevin Stefanski. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, without th without the division crown, he's not getting them. I don't think. Uh, with it, I think it's pretty powerful. And uh, just so everybody knows, clearly knows, the votes are they are they are yeah. tallied and counted before a single playoff game is contested. So the result of Texans over um, Browns is entirely immaterial. Um, but uh, and you know it, it it's even more ridiculous because Ryan's is. He was in charge of the team that overachieved the most. That is kind of a, a lot of the voting block defaults to that every year. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't agree with it. I think he was exceptionally lucky to get a generational talent at quarterback in the draft that he was banging the table for a defensive player, uh, and uh, he had a defense that might ultimately be his undoing in the playoffs this year. Uh, almost was his undoing on Saturday, if uh, if not for some <laughs> timely interceptions, but. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's probably going to be Ryan's, and uh, I think uh, if you had high hopes that a giant ticket on Stefanski was going to get there, I think you're you're in my shoes from last year. You're in Jay's shoes from last year, where Brian Dable beats the uh, you know beats the absolute tar out of the Jeff Jeff Saturday's Colts, quarterbacked by some combination of Nick Foles and Nate. Was it Eason? Jacob Eason? I don't even remember who the other quarterback was, but Sam because Ellinger. of that. Was it Ellinger? It was El yeah, Ellinger. He beat a combination of Ellinger and Foles by 40 points, the second week list last week of the season, and that was enough to get Dable over the line. So this yeah. is a bizarre award, uh, and it's not really reflective of the current state of coaching in any way, shape, or form, but I agree with you. I think it's probably going to be Rens. Yep. I think this is the award that is most <laughs> instructive. If, if I am right, and if Ryan's wins uh, and wins relatively comfortably, I think this is the award that is the most instructive in terms of just handicapping going forward where uh the fact that there was such a late swell for ryan's the same way there was a late swell for dayball is that this award is it can feel done and to me after stefanski beat the jets and everything that came out i didn't think it was like 99 percent, but i thought stefanski was 90 percent. i thought it was pretty close to done and i thought the only way that he was going to go down was uh some like weirdness potentially with mcdaniel or campbell or if D'Amico won the division, I thought that D'Amico had like a puncher's chance. And then that following week after the Jets win, there were a lot of people coming out, voters, saying, uh, no, I'm leaning towards voting D'Amico. It's like, what? He's, he's not even in the playoffs right now. Like, how can you be? And then all of a sudden I started getting the flashbacks because I, I was in the trenches, Drew, last year with Janet. <laughs> I was in... I was in the jungle in Vietnam with Willem Dafoe and Platoon. I was fighting for Shanahan, and then all of a sudden, we just go down to Dayball out of nowhere. And I could, as a Stefanski holder uh, at that time, I was just like, I can see it all again. Like, he's going to win this game against the Colts. Yeah. It's going to be Dayball against the Colts all over again. And then load it up as much as I could at the plus 800 D'Amico. Uh, and I think it is going to ultimately 
break that way. And it's just a reminder that voters change their minds. And so many voters sure. who the fancy, they flip to Ryan's because if you take a step back and we can talk about merit briefly in a sec, but if you take a step back and you were told before the season that the two coach of the year candidates uh, down the stretch are going to be uh, – a guy who's taken his team from three wins to 10 with a rookie quarterback and wins the division uh, yep. and does it uh, effectively clinching a playoff spot in prime time in week 18 against a team that has the best defense in the NFL, cycled through four quarterbacks, had a lot of injuries, and then was an 11-6 wild card. Like if you just presented those two cases, you'd be like, well, uh, D'Amico Ryan's is clearly winning. It's not clearly, really yeah. based on what right. resonates with voters. But just the sequencing and Stefanski and votes coming out for Stefanski, I think biased uh, everyone, including myself, um, until I got out at the last possible moment. Um, but it is it is interesting. On merit, just quickly, like the more I read, the more I think about it, I think my top two in this market, if I had a vote, would have been John Harbour and Sean McVay. Uh, yeah. And I mean, they, they're obviously not going to sniff the award, but I mean, who would you have voted for? Um, yeah, McVay definitely near the top for me. Um, LaFleur near the top for me. Sure. Yep. I mean, yeah, and I, I, we're saying this now colored by having seen these guys prepare for an execute a playoff game too. Uh, and yeah. maybe that's impacting my decision making here, but like, <clears throat> like, like step back and like LaFleur was coaching one of the, the, or one, did I say one of the, I think it is the youngest offense that we've ever seen take the field. And uh, to get that unit to grow the way that they did was just a truly amazing job throughout the balance of the season. And he's a seven seed. He barely gets into the playoffs. So he doesn't get that much consideration, I guess, didn't win his division. Um, you know, that that's, that's the way it goes. But you're right where you step back and <clears throat> I th like the winner inevitably always feels like a mea culpa for the voters right like uh, i didn't believe in you guys i yeah. this is on you know I'm, I'm this is a makeup for the fact that it be preseason. i didn't think you were anything special and here you are you won the division gotta reward you for that right like and that's that's kind of insane because <laughs> it's not ever connected with long-term lo you know longevity and success at this at the you know in the nfl level and that's why you have stuff like Matt Nagy winning and then being fired two, three years later. So, you know, like the, this, it's, uh, um, <clears throat> it does feel like, uh, you know, people vote on the basis of I didn't see it coming. And so, you know, this is my makeup and yep. uh, ridiculous. <laughs> I think this is the one award where you have to kind of keep hold of during the season the idea of like who do people want to vote for deep down like irrespective sure. of the actual case like who do they want to vote for because that's because they have the most wiggle room in this one to just go with who they want to vote for sure uh, and last year everyone wanted to vote for brian dayball because of the story and the giants and the big market and everything and this year everyone i think people wanted the three guys that people really wanted to vote for for most of the year were McDaniel, Campbell, and Ryans. Mm -hmm. And Campbell just took too many losses. McDaniel fell apart. And D'Amico was the clear guy by the end. The people just wanted to vote for him because of the story and because of him going back to Houston and the fact that they won 11 games in three years. And that just kind of overruled everything in the end. And I'm, I think he's going to win. Uh, I think that the guy that he was begging to take at number two, Will Anderson, <laughs> I think he's going to win Defensive Rookie of the Year as well. And I don't have... I'm very confident in D'Amico. I could be wrong. I don't think it's 100%. But I don't think it's that far off. I'm not close to 100% of Will Anderson, but I do think he is more likely to win than Jalen Carter and Kobe Turner. Uh, everyone has written off Jalen Carter because he was third on a lot of ballots. Like, I'm not putting a line through Jalen Carter. Like, I think that he is still potentially the lazy vote, frankly, in a way. Uh, and look, he has a case as well. Like, if you vote Jalen Carter, I don't think it's some... Um, you know, atrocity, the same way that voting Joe Flacco comeback player of the year is. But uh, <laughs> I think that Anderson, I think it's not a war crime, right? Yeah. yeah. Between three imperfect cases, I think Anderson has the least imperfect. Sure. And from what I've heard and seen from voters, I think that his case just resonates better than the yeah. other two because Carter's team collapsed. Not everyone knows what Kobe Turner looks like, frankly. Uh, and I think that Anderson is going to win, but I think it's going to be tight. And I think he's going to get a ton of second place votes. And I think yeah. he'll get enough first to tip him across the line. But to me, Anderson is like 60% to win the yeah. award. Uh, but what's your read on this one? Uh, well, completely independent. Could have used a little more production last night. Kobe Turner, 
uh, but that's fine. Um, no, the uh, the Will Anderson. I'm always surprised at what voters are using to narrow down to you know to to coin flip about who the all pro vote is gonna you know wh where they all you know where they're gonna vote and you know between two relatively similar cases all pro. Um, you know what statistics are they like leaning on looking at? And ESPN's pass rush win rate for whatever reason is getting circulated like it's God's truth. <laughs> and okay, uh, and you know for, in that context, like Will Anderson. Anderson looks as good as the players we know to be the best defenders yeah, in the NFL. AJ Watt. <laughs> yes. And so, like, hey, if you needed something to break a tie, here's a statistic that ESPN, we're sure, are keeping excellent track of pass rush one, right? <laughs> and, and really tells you a lot about a player's performance. Well, Will Anderson's near the top. So I guess that that, that breaks the tie for you. So I, I, I think that's kind of where this is going to come down to because otherwise it's really tough to split hairs. Jalen Carter was so clearly the more effective player for the first half of the season. And it, we know this with the wards, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Um, and, you know, the, the, Eagles being such a poison, you know, as far as just people's opinion of this team um, and, you know, falling out of the two seed into the wild card round five. Like, does that give people additional reason to uh, steer clear of awarding an Eagle? Yes. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, Kobe Turner, cool story. Uh, you know, he'll get invited to the show. Uh, he'll probably be in the top three. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think this is going to be Will Anderson, and um, you know the fact that you could get swings on this in the three to four to one range near the close when it was yeah. like this is there's like there is a very clear you know the wind is telling us something, and it's that people want another answer besides Jalen Carter. Well, that he was the next most likely guy, and so there you go. Um, and you know I do think people look at this award as like, a, hey, I'm going to make this decision because I have high confidence that he's going to be a future All-Pro, and the pass rush win rate cemented that for a ton of people in the voting block, I think. So um, PFF grade for Jalen Carter was outstanding among all defensive tackles. Like he, was ha he put together some absolutely disruptive performances, particularly in the first half of the season. He should get some recognition, which will be maybe enough to get second place. But um, ultimately, yeah, Will Anderson, uh, the – uh, the the Houston Texans uh, walking home with the uh, you know with, with the hardware on awards night feels pretty pretty likely. Yeah, I think with Anderson, it's a reminder as well that like when if, when you're betting these games and studying these markets, you you just kind of naturally just live game to game too much, and you attach too much weight to the game you've most recently seen because it felt mm -hmm. like after Anderson did frankly not much against the Colts in Week 18 because he couldn't move. It felt like oh, he's missed his chance, uh, and it kind of reminded me when I remember there was a there was a Knicks Heat game down the end of last season in like late March, where quickly came off the bench and won them won the Knicks the game and scored twenty five. And I was in the garden with mm -hmm. my daughter watching it, and in the moment, felt like oh, six man of the year is wrapped up because I was there and watching yeah, it, sure. kind of living every moment. And in reality, it's like well, probably like seven voters watch this game. Uh, and <laughs> Anderson, that's it felt like Anderson. generous <laughs> yeah, exactly so with Anderson it felt like oh he's you know he's he, he didn't capitalize but it's like well Carter and Turner did nothing the next day and voters are ultimately gonna look at the duration of the whole season uh yeah. and so I think he's gonna get there but um that is the award that I don't have did you uh, uh did he get any all pro consideration out. Will Anderson no did he land on anyone's uh, ballot yeah. he's just a tougher I mean, he, there's no case for him over, you know, Garrett and Parsons and Watt and Crosby. Carter, I think, got a couple of votes just because defensive tackle is a weaker field than okay. the superstar edge rushes. But yeah, my guess is it's going to be one Anderson, two Carter, three Turner. But uh, but I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, comeback player of the year to cap off. Uh, this is definitely the strangest market that I've ever followed across any award in any sport yeah. um, because you don't usually have a guy who came back from the dead. Um, as the odds-on favorite for the duration of the season. <laughs> Hamlin closed minus 400. Uh, Joe Flacco closed plus 350. And Baker Mayfield closed 8-1. to one. Those are the only three guys who have any chance of winning the award. My sense is, after how the season ended and what voters have come out and said, is that I think Hamlin is going to win. I think he's probably going to win with a little bit of cushion, but I don't think this is a lock. Uh, and I think if someone is going to get him, it's going to be Baker Mayfield where, uh, and it's a really strange market to cap because like, if you just kind of wait public opinion and you see what like, you know, uh, media pundits who don't have a vote, what they say just on like their radio show, uh, the day after 
Jets Browns or whatever, you would think the Flacco is going to win this in a runaway. But what voters have actually come out and said uh, and who they are leaning towards, like Flacco just doesn't get a look. And I don't, I'm not saying he's 0% to win the award, but everything that has come out so far, uh, Hamlin is definitely in the lead in terms of what has been made you know, public. Uh, Mayfield is definitely second and Flacco is third. Now that could change with the remaining votes and maybe there's a, a hidden um, Flacco conglomerate or a hidden Mayfield conglomerate that is going to tip the race. But it is very strange just like why there is such a divide between non-voter media pundits and actual voters. And my, my gut sense, uh, and I'm not 100% on this, but my gut sense would be that the weight of actually having a vote uh, just gives more kind of uh, it gives more credence or it makes you sway more towards Mayfield playing 17 games and Flacco only playing five games. That is yeah. my sense, but what do you yeah. think? No, no, the, the, the Flacco is not, I don't even know if he, if he's going to get invited. I'll, there'll be people will leave him off because of how a uh, few games he played surely. Um, and the, the Mayfield vote is the same as the coach of the year kind of conceptually, where it's like people didn't believe that he was going to be able to do anything this year. He made the playoffs. Like I was wrong. <laughs> like, Oh, got to acknowledge how wrong I was about this player in my, <clears throat> my anchoring. Um, uh, but the Hamlin story is truly unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, he is active for the Bills playoff game today against the Steelers. I'm not sure if you yeah. saw that. Um, obviously, it does not matter for this award at all, but just the fact that there, you know, that he has been a contributing part of an NFL team this year is unreal. I did not think I bet I made bets against him in the offseason because I was like, Bill's really going to put him back out there. Really? They're really yeah. going to do this. <laughs> like he's he's not just going to be kind of, you know, the 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 mascot, the, you know, the the this the silent like locker room, you know, leading guy. No, he played. He practiced ever. He practiced the entire uh, season. He contributed on the field. I really have zero doubt uh, that it is one of the most impressive uh, and outrageous things that's happened in my life watching football. Um, and uh, I think he's the rightful, you know, rightfully deserves the award. And I think they're going to give it to him. It'll probably gonna be a pretty emotional moment <laughs> in the awards night. Honestly, like, I, guy, guy is is uh, is a pretty. A pretty unbelievable story, um, and uh, I think the NFL is going to be right in leaning into making it sort of the center point of the awards night. Yep, it will be so strange if he <laughs> is a finalist for them. We've talked about this. If he, he's going to be a finalist, <laughs> clearly, uh, and if he loses the award to Joe Flacco or Baker Mayfield, is going to be the weirdest moment uh, in the history yeah. of the awards ceremony. They cut to a forlorn yeah. Demar Hamlin. Sorry, Demar, um, but Baker Mayfield won the NFC South. Uh, so better luck next year. I do I have one. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go for go for it. I, I right. was going to change the topic, but yeah, you you hit it. I was just going to say, I think Mayfield would have been more live if not for the fact that the Bucks were kind of the most uninspiring division yeah, champion true. in recent memory. And going, I mean, true. to be fair, they were probably more uninspiring last year when they went eight and nine on the division. But <laughs> oh, uh, really I think really the worse, fact yeah. that if Mayfield had really balled out in week 18, I think he would have won over some of the voters who are probably going to vote, you know, Flacco or some weirdness like Stafford, Purdy, Lamar. He might have been able to kind of coalesce all of that vote behind him. But uh, I just think that I think the key with this market and why I think Hamlin is going to win is we do have some sample of people who aren't voting Hamlin still having him on the ballot uh, and just kind of feeling bad if he's not at least third or if not second, even if they don't want, if they uh, have a problem with the limited amount of time he played. I think that combined with what I think will be 20 plus first place votes, I think that should see him over the line. Okay. Um, do you have any leans for uh, Walter Payton man of the year? Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not Dak Prescott. <laughs> How about he's not coming back to back in, in uh, WP and NFL MOY? Um, no. the uh, the salute to service award, no, uh, nice. but late selly of the year. What was the best celebration of the year? I, I, okay, so in, I'm making jokes, Sorry. obviously. There's like 10 other awards that <laughs> they're gonna give out on awards night that don't have markets up. Number one, why. Like if we're gonna lean into like awards betting, just 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 put them all up, put everything up, make it, let people bet everything. Like like they, they, I really don't know why if you're gonna lead it, you know, why are you gonna stop it at comeback player, here, right? Like uh, like let let people have some fun. Uh, and then uh, number two, if we are gonna do a, a, a you know a, a broadcast for the show, we're, we'll we're getting 
make let's make some markets <laughs> we'll put a little side pool together uh because you know if you don't already participate in pools for like oh the oscars uh where everybody kind of has their ballot and you make all your choices and you know winner you know uh you know winner takes the pool like yeah, might might as well like kind of lean into it because there are like 10 awards that are, don't have markets that uh, are going to be uh, talked about that night so i think yeah, we should no. lean into it Listen, there. I think the common, the conventional wisdom among most people is that Ryan's is going to win a close vote against Stefanski, and I'm trying. I'm literally trying to book, like I'm trying mm, to get. Yeah. So I'm trying to get alt ha- lines on like handicap the it. Minus yes, nine let's and a half it. First place oh. votes. Yeah, no, I'm without for, question. For without a question. Yes, let's set. We'll set. We'll set some fairs, and uh, we'll let people have Adam, uh, even if it's just in good fun. Yep. No, I like it. All right. I also like the Australian Open uh, in my hometown of. <laughs> Melbourne. Uh, I used to love the Aussie Open as a as a kid, Drew, and I still mm. love it now. Uh, and I'm all in Elena Rabakina. Uh, have we ever figured out the pronunciation? I feel like we've just gone back. Yeah, no, you, that's it. That's it. Rabakina. Rabakina. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's start there uh, with the women's singles champion. Uh, Iga Swiatek is the favorite, as she so often is, at plus two twenty five. So her draw isn't the easiest. Sabalenka is on the easier side. She's plus 450. Rabakina, 5-1. to one. Goff, 5-1. to one. And there ends your list of favorites. Then it's a massive drop-off to Jess Pagula uh, at 22-1, to one, who I'm not, I don't think, ever going to bet on to win a slam uh, until she shows me a little bit more. Uh, so what is your read on the women's side? Yeah, you kind of keyed the most important aspect of the draw, which is that we have a huge imbalance. Um, a lot of the informed players, a lot of the past champions are on the top half of this draw. Um, so far, the kind of most consequential match for shaking out uh, the winner was um, last night, Caroline Garcia defeated Naomi Osaka. Um, Osaka was the kind of player that the longer you let her hang around, the more of a threat she was going to be, be, you know, become because she just doesn't have a lot of uh, match play under her belt. And, uh, and with her out now in round one, uh, that sets up pretty clearly Coco uh, to win Q3. Uh, Coco looks great, by the way. Like, she's made some nice adjustments to her game. Like, uh, she's building off of what it was a really impressive late summer fall swing for her in the U.S. Open title. So um, she's a factor. I would make her the most likely uh, finalist from the bottom because I I, even though uh, Sabalenka has a very soft Q4, quarter four is is bad 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 um sabalenka should win that going away but uh if it's coco sabalenka in the semifinals sabalenka is going to be the favorite and she probably shouldn't be because she has huge demons when it comes to that stage of the tournament and coco goff has uh you know weapons that sabalenka hasn't proven she can um you know get around to this point in their uh you know very kind of brief not a lot of head-to-head data really to to kind of shake out between those two women who is the better player so um i'm excited to bet golf in that particular moment and send golf to the finals uh and i think um rebecca and iga is uh probably going to be the match of the first half of the season i would guess like that that it's too tight titanic uh forces in women's tennis right now in peak form uh with new weapons um rubakana if you don't remember got covid twice last year it bopped her she it bopped her out of the uh the french open uh and then kind of affected her again in the uh, u.s swing so uh she was never really right she needed the off season to you know kind of get her health and fitness back up and uh what we saw from her in brisbane was superlative she was dynamic in every aspect of the word um to uh in defeating uh, uh sabalenka particularly in that finals uh so yeah she's going to be uh she's going to be tough to beat i think this is going to be one of the chalkier women's uh slams that we ever have um i mean of the four i i guess he, Iga's maybe the one that you have the least confidence gets there because she has to go through Ostapenko. Uh, yeah. She has to go through Svitolina. Uh, she'll, she, you know, she'll have to, um, you know, she, the, the top seeded player in her section was uh, Von Drusova, who's out. Uh, so she's, you know, but realistically, it was probably always going to be Ostapenko in the quarterfinals there. So um, yeah, her, her run is, is uh, notably difficult. Pretend, you know, Slam winner in Kennan in round one, who she should beat. Slam winner potentially in Kerber in round two, who she should beat. Uh, Linda Noskova, who is an up-and-coming young player in round three, she should beat. 
Uh, and then it gets really interesting because Svitolina is right there who beat her in Wimbledon. Um, and uh, Ostapenko is right there who tends to beat her a lot, beat her at the U.S. Open. So um, <clears throat> Iga's got a lot to prove to win this title. Uh, ultimately, I think she is still the rightful favorite. But uh, I uh, interesting to hear your, your full-on Lena Rybakina because – it always feels good betting on her. I gotta be honest. <laughs> she's such a mental monster. She's a yeah. she is just uh she does she she does not lose. Um she gets beaten, sure, but she uh uh she doesn't beat herself, and that's a huge uh you know, huge element of this this sport. Yeah. I don't really understand why Rebecca just isn't the favorite to win the tournament because I think she has a little bit of an easier draw than Ega. And you mentioned the fact that like Ega is probably gonna have to get through to the final what you mentioned that like Svitolina beat her um, in Wimbledon. Ostapenko beat her at the U.S. Open. Is that what I'm remembering? Yeah, that yeah, correct? Yep. Right. And then and then Rebecca beat her at the Australian Open. Kind of trucked yeah. her as well. Yeah. And yeah. I think that Rebecca just has the highest ceiling of any player on the women's side. I mean, you could make the case for Sabalenka as well. Um, but I think that Rebecca, the fact that she has that ceiling, she's in form. I mean, she annihilated. Sabalenka in the lead yeah. of that three in love. Um, yeah. So just destroyed her. And you mentioned the, the mental fortitude. Like she is the one, uh, if we're saying that the top three is Shriantek, Sabalenka, Rabakina, like she is the one who I think is the most, uh, you have the most confidence in um, to deliver in that, like Sabalenka obviously has her own demons. And then Iga, for as tough as Eager is and as unkillable as she seems at times, like she also bottles matches. Like she really sure. bottled Wimbledon. Like that was a match that she really shouldn't have oh. lost. And she just completely imploded. And she gets in her own head. She really tried to bottle the US Open final against Ons Jabeur. She bottled the tried to bottle the French Open final against Mukova. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't know why Rabakina just isn't the favorite, but uh, <laughs> you follow this more closely than I do. So I'll defer to each other. And obviously Eager can't be discounted, but um that would be my lane. Uh, at the yeah, I mean the the the, the, the Ega number, Ega's return numbers are unreal. Like yeah. Rabakina is lives on serve for the most part. Um, yeah. You know, she's she's not as dynamic a returner, and this is a tough court. To, you know, court speeds are tough for to be a good returner. So it's she's it's just a little more fragile in terms of like she's gonna have to win tie breaks. She's gonna have to win high leverage points, and she can do it absolutely. She can, but uh, the pedigree of return that uh, Eager brings to the table is definitely higher quality. So yep. that's 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 really the only reason, though. Otherwise, like yeah, all your points are fair. Like if there's a no show or weird uh, weird performance by Eager this fortnight, none of us will be surprised. I will be disappointed <laughs> because I want to see Eager Rabakina at uh, peak powers head to head. Like that's the other kind of weird thing about women's tennis. Last point here. We have four women right now who are near their peak of their career ELO rating, yep. which is real. First of all, they're all elite numbers and they're all right at the peak right now, which is going to make like this particular tournament, Indian Wells, the clay swing, like it's all going to be just phenomenally entertaining for the entire 2024 calendar. Um, and then you mix in some of the, uh, you know, the other fun stories like no- Naomi Osaka coming back and emergence of the other young talent on tour, like women's tennis is in a phenomenally good place right now. Yep. No, hundred percent. And looking forward to uh, I, like for this, for the spectator, I hope that they get the final four <laughs> that everyone is expecting. Um, personally, I hope the final four is Rebecca and, and then three unseated players. Um, but we're probably not headed that direction. Uh, quickly, before we close out on the men's side, Djokovic, even money, Alcaraz plus 360, Yannick Sinner, your man, plus 650, and then Medvedev and Zverev are the next two. Uh, I don't have any bets in this market, but uh, if I were to have a bet, it would probably be Yannick Sinner, uh, who is looking pretty good in his quarter. Uh, what's your read on um, your man Yannick uh, and the rest of the field? Yeah, I have some center. Uh, center six to one was my uh, my only swing in the men's market pre flop, um, and I have some no on Djokovic as well because I, yeah. the wrist injury he's carrying. He keeps saying it's not a big deal, but that's usually the other way around, right? Like he's usually very vocal about how big an injury is if it's really not. <laughs> he's just you know kind of using it as like a little bit of a, a you know misdirection. The fact that him he and his camp are so adamant that this is not a problem, that's not an issue, uh, and then. And the lapses we've seen from him just to play this, you know, just so far this season in terms of uh, match play and, you know, going back to 
um, you know, how, you know, how he struggled in Paris when he ultimately won, how he struggled at the ATP finals, which he ultimately won. <laughs> like he's like, it's weird. We're kind of at this point with them, but you got to pick on him a little bit, I think, and kind of downgrade him a little bit in terms of ceiling because, um, you know, he's, he's got a tough path, a tough quarter. Um, he's going to have some, he's going to have some matches, uh, that he is going to have to find a, a higher level, another gear. And if his injury is limiting him, then, uh, he is vulnerable. And certainly the fact that center got him, uh, a uh, clean win against him in the tour finals in a match that he played, you know, you know, played up uh, was uh, was very, very, I think, instructive that Sinner is kind of reaching that next level of his game. I know Sinner then ultimately lost the tour finals final to him. Um, but, uh, you know, just still the the margin between those two players on a fast hard court is not that large. Uh, and so I think that uh, Sinner can get him in best of five setting if that's your semifinal. Um, and Alcaraz is definitely in the mix. Like, don't get me wrong, like his half of the draw is softer. Um, I, I would make him a healthy favorite over Medvedev if that's your um bottom half semifinal um but i think ultimately the winner of the tournament is going to come down to that semifinal between sinner and djokovic uh and i give uh give sinner a, a, a puncher's chance in that one and i give alcaraz a puncher's chance if it's a, a djokovic alcaraz final and in fact the idea of sinner potentially kind of doing some damage to djokovic and then djokovic losing a hard court slam final we've heard this before <laughs> <laughs> happened at the U.S. Open when Medvedev got him after Zverev took all the juice out of him. So, um, you know, definitely keep keep uh, an open mind on uh, you know that particular Medvedev or Center or Medvedev or Alcaraz getting the better of Djokovic in a final is is not crazy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, conditions are look look cool. I guess it's worth saying that. Like, I'm not expecting weather or uh, heat to be as much of an impact as it is at times. Um, and uh, ultimately, yeah, like the men's tennis game, right? You know, men's field is in pretty solid shape as well, even though like we have had a couple of lost generations. Um, the next gen right now looks very, very good. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll get around Yannick Sinner. The new year hasn't started until I lose <laughs> money on uh, Yannick Sinner sleeping with a light on in a uh, Grand Slam <laughs> final or semi. I uh, look forward to that going down. All right. We are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. If you're listening to us as a podcast, please don't forget to rate and subscribe. And a reminder, you can find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you soon.